You know, Maya Angelou said to me years ago when I'd come back from doing my school in South Africa, the opening of the school, and I was, she, she wasn't able to attend. So I came directly from South Africa to Maya's house, Jay, and I was sitting at the kitchen table and she was teaching me how to make biscuits. And I said, oh, Maya, the school's going to be so, that school's going to be my legacy. It's going to be incredible. And she said, you have no idea what your legacy is going to be because your legacy is every life you touch. Your legacy isn't one thing. Your legacy is everybody who was moved to, who watched your show, who went back to school, who got out of a domestic violent relationship, who changed the way they saw things. What I, what I realize is that if you come into success and fame, and particularly fame, because fame is its own world and definition, because it really is based upon what other people think of you. So, because fame isn't what you think of yourself, it's what other people think of you. Um, when, if you come into that and you don't have a grounded, centered self, you will be controlled by the outside instead of the inside. And if you come into that, not in the fullness of knowing who you are and what you're supposed to do with that fame, whenever somebody likes you or doesn't like you, that determines whether or not you're having a good day or a bad day. And you, are, you have lost control of your, your own life. So I think what fame teaches you quickly is to grow the wholeness within yourself so that you're not controlled by others outside opinions of you. Each of us comes into the world with our own worldview. And that worldview is actually shaped from the crib. And you get from the world what you project into the world and you project into the world what you were raised with and what you were raised around. So that's why what happened to you is the essential question. I want people to understand, most importantly, that when you are arguing with a friend and they act like they can't hear you because they're arguing so strongly back at you, they really can't because of the way the brain is structured. So when you're in fear mode, anxiety mode, when you're really amped up, you just need to, both of you need to calm down, take a walk, take a break and come back. Well, you start with understanding that your cup being full is how you allow yourself to give to other people. You, you can't give what you don't have. You can't love if you haven't been loved. You don't even know how to begin to do that. So I think it begins with fundamentally understanding that you are worthy enough, you are valuable enough, you matter enough to give yourself the love that you deserve. And that starts by taking out time for yourself. So I have my own rhythm and pattern. I know that if I go six days and then on the seventh, by the seventh or eighth, don't give myself a break, that lots of other things give, that I'm not as alert, I'm not as attuned, I'm not as centered, I'm not as focused. So I know that that is, that is my limit. I cannot go beyond a certain amount of days. And for me, um, walking in nature uh, is my solace. It is where I feel that I am one with all and all being, you know, all creation and, you know, connected. For other people, it may be dancing, it may be music, it may be knitting, it may be whatever it is that brings some kind of rhythmic pattern into your life. Actually, it was Bruce and I were walking on my campus in South Africa and uh, there were a group of girls dancing, literally on the lawn, because Lord knows they love to dance. And Bruce says, oh, that's not just, I said, oh, they're just having fun. And Bruce said, oh, they're not just having fun, they actually are healing themselves. Mm -hmm. Because the rhythmic pattern, that's why when you've been in an argument with someone, or you're in the middle of an argument with somebody, if you just go and take a walk, or you go and turn on some music and you start dancing. If you just have some form of movement, you feel better. One of the most important things, most, most important takeaways from what happened to you, I believe, is understanding how the brain works. You understand that when you're upset or in fear or angry or are in, in an antagonized state, 
and you're trying to reason with a person, a child, your spouse, your boss, your friend, they literally cannot hear you because the reasoning part of the brain is in the cortex and what you're saying is only reaching the brain stem. So whenever somebody is dysregulated, which is what that is, being anxious and fearful and yelling and screaming, the thing to do is to calm yourself first, then you will be able to help that other person get calm and regulated. That's how you get to reason. But if you both are just yelling at each other, literally, and you're going, you don't hear me and you don't hear me either. And you know, they actually cannot hear you. That's what I thought was so fascinating. One of the most important things I have learned with coping is to accept this moment for what it is. Do not spend your energy pushing again. And that's whether you are late in traffic or whether you are late on your bills and you don't know where the next uh, uh, paycheck is coming from to do it. Don't spend your energy resisting what is. You know, the five stages of grief begin with shock and denial and end with acceptance. I have found that to be a great formula for operating in any crisis or challenging circumstance. Get to acceptance as quickly as you can, and that will allow you to cope better with this present moment. Because when you are pushing against, I wish it wasn't this way. I mean, I've seen so many people during this pandemic, last March, can't, I can't wait until this is over. That was last March, now we're a year later. And they've spent the year in resistance instead of, ah, this is where we are. Not so sure when we're gonna get to shore. I just better learn how to tread stronger. Oh, my legs are getting stronger in the tread. So being able to accept the treading moment for what it is and, and having the wisdom, the faith, the understanding, the knowing that you're not gonna be in this moment forever. Because if life does anything, it consistently, consistently changes. So for however long we're in this pandemic moment, it is not going to be forever, but how do I make the adjustment to accept the moment for what it is and stop pushing against it, using all of my energy, wanting it to be something that it's not. It's that whole adage of accepting the things you can change and being willing to live with the things you cannot. So that has been the most helpful for me. I don't have a problem coping because I immediately go to, this is what it is. Now what must I do to be fully present in this moment, not resisting and pushing against it? I thought trauma had to be a big, gigantic thing, experience. You had to go through a tsunami, literally, a, if not literally a tsunami, a tsunami-like crisis in your life a fire, a hurricane, a tragedy, a car accident, a stabbing, a, somebody died. And it was through co-authoring this book with him that I understood that it was the consistent little things. It was the aggressions and microaggressions in a person's life that causes them to have their own worldview whatever that worldview is for you is different from me. So the biggest, the biggest learning for me is that trauma doesn't have to have a great big old capital T on it. It's really how you were loved and that neglect and trauma are hand in hand because both are equally as toxic. I, over the years of interviewing people, it was my greatest classroom. I was always paying attention to what people were saying and paying attention to their lives. And what I understood and could articulate, not through science, but just through my own observation, is that, oh, people are as dysfunctional, as unhappy, as disoriented in their lives based on how far they are from the center of themselves. And the center is where wholeness lies, as you know. And so where there is no where there is no center and there is no sense of wholeness and love for yourself, there's going to be a disarray, chaos, confusion, and, you know, dysfunction in your life. 
And I saw that over and over and over again, that people behave based on how they were loved and then how they were able to process that in, that, that in a way to love other people. One of, the, one of the most important points I think Dr. Perry makes in What Happened to You is that neglect is as toxic as trauma. And so even though you might not have had a trauma with a big T, mm. that the, it boils down to, did you get what you needed? And I have done so many interviews, as I know you have too, Jay, with people who are raised in the same family and everybody in that family has a different experience. And sometimes siblings are arguing about a thing that happened because from their point of view, it felt like one thing. And from the other person's point of view, it felt like another thing. Well, that is the reality of life, that you can have two children, four children, six children raised in the same household, and they experience the love of their parents differently. And not all the kids could have gotten what they needed, and some of the kids got what they needed. So neglect is you not getting what you needed for your worldview, for your personal um, approach to life, your sense of self values, your, your sense of self-esteem. And so I, I, I have seen in the thousands of interviews that I've done over the years, that the level of dysfunction in a per person's life is almost directionally, directionally, per directly proportional to how they were loved, what happened to them, and how they were able to receive or not receive that love. So it, the, 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 the what happened to you isn't, you know, just for people who had the big T traumas, but it literally is what happened to you. Were you loved? Were you not? How were you loved? How was that love applied in your life? And were you able then to apply it in the rest of the world? You know, one. relatives say, I, I, I'm whipping you because I love you. Well, it certainly didn't feel like love, certainly mm -hmm. didn't feel like love, but I know that for that generation, the idea of I'm going to keep you in line and I'm going to make sure you're disciplined and that you're going to yes. obey and do the right thing in their minds might have felt like love, but certainly right. did not feel like or was interpreted by me to mean love. I mean, I think now, and I know if you are culturally raised uh, the way I was, you have a lot of, of pain behind those whippings. And I remember doing a show on the Oprah show years later, talking about should children be spanked and a black woman stood up and said, well, I got beat every day and my father, I was in the choir and my father beat me in front of the, the whole congregation in church and I turned out okay. And I'm like, did you really? Because nobody, anybody who's ever been hit realizes the humiliation of that. What you feel more than anything, even as a little kid, is the humiliation of it. And what you are being told in that moment is that you have no value, that you are worth nothing, that you are so worthless that I get now to lay my hands on you and physically beat you. So it takes a lot, and I, I would have to say that um, it, it, it was a lot for me to overcome to begin to understand that my life was of value. And as I say in What Happened to You, what did that for me were relationships with my teachers. I could cry right now thinking about the, the teachers who stood in the gap for me and made me feel valued, made me feel important. So it was only at school or speaking in church 
that I felt a sense of I mattered, that there was some meaning and, 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 and purpose for me in life. I, you know, grew up in these circumstances where I should have no self-values, no self-worth, but Bruce, as he explains in What Happened to You, you don't have to have it come from your family. Other relationships with people who mm -hmm. are nurturing, supporting, caring, and actually just see you. So the reason why I love school so much is because that's the place that I felt seen.